Now, we all know that they say beauty is only skin deep, but we also know that they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So which of those is most important? If it is only skin deep, then why should that matter? If the person viewing can see true beauty, isn't that more important? Such is the predicament in tonight's story. Another fantastic effort from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so I could read the stories that you've shared with me directly with all of you. And a fantastic one we have for you this evening. What is beauty? How can it be defined? How can we see the ugliness or the beauty deep inside a person? Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. Hi. My name's Brianna, and this is my story. I don't know if anyone will ever actually read this, but, well, I had to try. Besides, it's not like I have anything better to do these days. Perhaps I'll even be able to warn someone and do some good during the course of my pathetic existence before it's too late. My time's almost up. The clock is ticking. Seconds near running out as the treatments grow more and more intense. Sooner or later... I know that'll be my demise. No one cares, though. Not the doctors, not the orderlies, or the scientists marvelling at my condition, treating me as if I was some bizarre mutation of nature, less than a person. And they're all just following my father's orders to cure me by any means necessary, even if a side effect is death. I guess if I die, you'll still think it's better than looking as I do. I used to think that way as well, though. So I understand. It's what I get. Well, no, it's what I deserve. I won't waste your time convincing you that I'm a good person who didn't deserve what happened to me. In truth, I was an awful person. An extremely vapid, self-absorbed teenage bully. I spent my high school days making the lives of my peers as miserable as possible. A few friends within my inner circle were... I'm certain we're only there to lessen the intensity of my cruelty inflicted upon them. I highly doubt any of them will miss me, only noticing my absence in relief. No one has come to visit me, although that doesn't surprise me, honestly. I could make up excuses for my behaviour, but that doesn't matter. Plenty of children's mothers abandon them when they're young, but not all of them turn out wretched like me. Besides... I lived a comfortable life of luxury. My father, a CEO of a prominent company, provided me with anything and everything I asked for in lieu of uh, parental guidance. My nannies, who were also the housekeepers and cooks, were always more concerned with completing their daily tasks than with me, so I was allowed free reign. Perhaps I acted out as a cry for attention or wanted others to hurt as badly as I felt or just wanted to mask my own pain. Yes, how cliché. Regardless, my behaviour was inexcusable. This lesson was learned far too late, and not just for me. There was one girl in my high school I was particularly relentless to, Shannon. She had large rim glasses and frizzy, unkempt hair that was always tied back in a messy bun resembling a poodle tail, and not a well-maintained one. Although, with some hair product to tame her wild mane, and contacts so her beautiful eyes were on display and her face was revealed, she could have easily been prettier than me, even without makeup that her strict parents wouldn't allow her to wear. Yeah, maybe jealousy is why I was so merciless towards her. She was beautiful in her own way without any effort, and her parents loved her enough to give her guidelines. Shannon and I were both part of the student council. I was class president due to my highly successful intimidation and... A vote for me is a vote for awesome campaign, which I thought would make my father proud, but alas, no. This accomplishment was met with the usual hollow, Oh, that's great, hon, response, uttered from behind the screen of the laptop he was always engrossed with on the rare occasion we managed to have breakfast together. Knowing nothing I could accomplish at school would gain his recognition. I spent my time in student council planning dances and parties, leaving the harder, Less exciting tasks to my vice president, and made things as difficult as possible for Shannon, the class treasurer, who I was exceptionally rude to during our meetings before school. Anytime she countered one of my ideas by saying we didn't have the funds, 
I would blame her for her lack of ability to do her job, rather than accepting the fact that I was constantly exceeding the budget and not terribly helpful at fundraisers. I also seized every opportunity to question and contradict nearly everything she said. During one particular meeting, we were discussing the upcoming Halloween dance. While Shannon was explaining how much money would be available from what we earned at the recent bake sale and car wash, I rolled my eyes to the secretary and vice president beside me and whispered, oh, We should donate some of that for conditioner for her wild hair. Or we could save money by unleashing it and throwing spiders in it as a decoration. Oh, we erupted in giggles, barely making any effort to suppress the sound. Shannon froze mid-sentence, disconcertedly looking towards us. She knew the laughter was disrespectfully directed at her. The look of hurt in her eyes will haunt me until I am granted the courtesy of death. Well, once I finally noticed the silence of her stupefied state, I explained with a cheery smile, still snickering, Oh, sorry, that was rude of me. There was a long pause where we both stared at each other. Shannon appeared stunned, like a deer in the road caught in the blinding illumination of headlights and I, like a confident queen, daring her to challenge me with my gaze and confident demeanour. I could see in her eyes she wanted to say something in her defence, but was unsure of how to proceed, as she was too afraid and embarrassed. Her cheeks were overtaken with rosy heat. No, it was just this thing, I added, hardly feigning an explanation. It didn't have anything to do with this, though. I was just being rude, sorry. Please continue. I smiled clasped my fingers together, and leaned in to sarcastically demonstrate focus. Shannon shuffled her papers around, stammered for a moment before quickly finishing her previous thought, and sat silently staring at an invisible spot in the centre of the table through the rest of the meeting. She seemed defeated, and I should have stopped there, but that wasn't enough for my content. I wanted to completely break her. The meeting adjourned and the council filed out into the hallway, where my three closest friends, dubbed Breeze Bitches by the rest of the school, which I may have encouraged, were awaiting my release. Hey guys, watch this, I excitedly whispered to them and anticipated Shannon's approach. When she was within an arm's reach, I sprang, dropping her pants to her ankles and revealing her full coverage underwear. <laughs> I freaking knew it. I shouted, seeking to get as much attention drawn to the situation as possible. Hey everyone, check out Granny Panties! My posse erupted in laughter on cue. Fellow students passing by chuckled at my prank and carried on. A few had pained expressions of sympathy on their faces, but no one came to her aid. Shannon simply stood there, shocked, mouth agape and completely mortified. Tears welled up in her eyes. Snapping back to reality, she pulled up her yoga pants and ran down the hallway out the door. I stood there triumphant for a moment, like a hunter gloating over a fresh kill. If there was an Olympic event revolving around despicable acts of high school cruelty, I would have just won gold. Shannon was missing for the rest of the school day. Our council meetings convened before school on Friday, so I assumed she went home to take a break from me for the weekend. I was a little surprised and, to my now shame, impressed with myself. Never before had I pushed her to the point of running home. Even at that time, deep down in the recesses of what remained of my minuscule conscience beneath seemingly infinite years of an icy cold exterior, I realised I'd gotten to her and maybe pushed things too far. This revelation came to me during lunch, while sitting outside with my posse. I stifled my brief glimmer of humanity and asked the group, Has anyone seen Granny Panties since this morning? Nope. I think Shannon went home, Connor answered without looking up at me between bites of his hamburger. I could tell he was disapproving of the encounter earlier, but knew better than to question me. Still, I hated to be treated with such disdain. For anyone else, silent judgments would be quickly chided, but I'd secretly been crushing on Connor since freshman year, and to an extent I respected his opinion, even if it was irrelevant to my actions. I respected Mandy's opinion as well. We'd been best friends before I became a monstrosity. In her own way, she tried to influence me for the better, 
but after failing miserably, still stuck by my side. The fourth person in our group was Brandon, Mandy's boyfriend. I could tell he despised me, and I mutually didn't care about him either, but he loved Mandy and had to tolerate me to be with her. He knew to keep his mouth shut about my behavior and could pretend to like me. I, in turn, reciprocated the cordiality. These were the people I surrounded myself with. At least Mandy truly was my friend. Upon reflection, maybe she stuck around in hope that I would become the girl I once was. The girl who protected her from middle school bullies until I transformed into one myself. Once, a girl in our class was picking on Mandy in the lunch line, saying she didn't need the calories, calling her fat, and blamed her acne on a poor diet. Mandy wasn't fat. Uh, she's never had the body type of a stick figure Barbie like me, but she wasn't overweight. This was right around the time she hit puberty, so in response to all the new hormones ravaging her system, her skin was a little broken out, becoming manageable soon after this instance. However, the girl picking on her was stout, without any signs of curves developing later in life. She resembled a stocky boy, and her face was covered in deep-pitted scars from scratching at chicken pox as a child. When I overheard the horrible things she was saying to my best friend since kindergarten, I burst over in a flash of blind fury. My fist exploded into her face, and she fell back against the floor. I then articulated my anger towards her, and opened her eyes to every floor she possessed. She cowered to me from then on, and left Mandy alone. Word spread like a disease through my peers until the school was completely convinced that I was not one to agitate. Mandy had peace, and I was feared. It was my first seductive taste of power, and I was instantly addicted. I never wished to lose my status, and I began to thrive on the misery of others. Almost as if in competition with myself, I was always looking for ways to push things further and further until, well... Here I am. Truthfully, I hadn't thought what I'd done to Shannon was that extreme, but, but you never know what's going on in someone else's mind, or how an action will affect them. After school that day, while my friends and I were leaving, we discussed plans for the weekend. Connor asked, Hey, you guys checked out the carnival in town yet? No, dude, but Brock said it's totally lit, Brandon enthusiastically answered. Ugh, I loudly sighed, rolling my eyes. What's wrong? Mandy asked. Lit. It's so stupid, and you sound like an idiot when you use it. I scolded Brandon for using a word I abhor so deeply, mostly because I hadn't used it first. Well, that's what he said, Brandon explained with a shrug as he kicked the ground. There were a few seconds of awkward silence before Connor hesitantly chimed in. So, uh, you guys want to check out the carnival? It's not for, like, little kids, right? I asked, realizing my misplaced pessimism as the words slipped off my lips. God, what was I thinking? This was my chance with Connor. It could be like a double date. At some point, we could lose Mandy and Brandon, maybe ride the ferris wheel together, and I could finally get that first kiss with him. Well, I'm sure there's a few kiddie rides, but I've heard there's some really intense ones too. One's called Vertigo. First, you're strapped into a seat with the vest light bars that drop over your head and your legs and arms are free. Then, it raises you really high up. Higher than all the other rides, and it flips you upside down and drops you all the way back so that you're spinning like somersaulting, stopping just before you hit the ground. Everyone released excited sounds of oohs and whoas. Ooh, that sounds really awesome. Come on, let's do it, I said ecstatically. Okay, when are we doing this? Mandy asked. How about tonight at seven? Um, we could all meet up there, I suggested eagerly. Yeah, sure. Okay, was heard amongst the group. Mandy and I parted ways from the boys to go get ready. I wanted to be sure I'd have enough time for preparation to look irresistible to Connor. We met up with the guys ten minutes past seven in front of the entrance to the carnival. I told Mandy that I preferred to be fashionably late, but in reality I was nervous, needing a few minutes to collect myself in the bathroom before we left. 
Such a quality was unbecoming, and therefore beneath me. Never would I admit feeling that way to anyone, even to my best friend. I decided on wearing a little black dress that showed just enough skin in all the right places, not wanting to look like I was trying too hard, but still incredibly alluring. Connor looked quite handsome, smiling at me as Mandy and I approached. He changed out of his school clothes into nicer, dark wash faded jeans and a button-up, plaid, long sleeve shirt. It looked all the more impressive in contrast to Brandon, who was still wearing the same attire he'd worn all day at school and possibly slept in. Oh, he was such a slob. I wondered how Mandy could stand to date him when she could do far better. At least he was thick-skinned enough to handle me. The important thing was that she was happy. Despite my vast narcissism, I wanted the very best and happiness for her. Let's do this, Connor proclaimed, eagerly rubbing his hands together in anticipation. Mandy took Brandon's hand and the four of us entered the carnival. As we strolled in, we were greeted with an overwhelming array of flashing neon lights and loud carnival music blaring over the sounds of rickety rides running. We paused for a minute, absorbing the atmosphere and weighing our options. What do we want to do first? Connor asked with excited, glistening eyes. His boyish charm was one of his more enticing qualities. Well, first things first, we should probably go get some tickets, Brandon answered. Oh yeah, Connor responded. Laughing lightly and nodding in agreement, the four of us lined up at the ticket booth. I bought mine first and waited off to the side for my friends, surveying the sea of possibilities spanning around me. One booth in particular caught my eye. It was called He Sees You on the banner, and it was for a caricature artist unlike any other I'd seen previously. The sample art strewn around the walls of the interior of the booth was captivating. Some were abstract angelic or demonic portraits, while others were beautiful representations and, and some were outright grotesque. Entranced, it held my gaze until my friends rejoined me. See something you like? Connor asked, attempting to follow my line of sight to uncover what I was intently staring at. Yeah, I said, semi-snapping out of the trance that held me captive. Yeah, I, um, I think I want to get one of those caricatures done. They seem pretty cool. Well, you can do that, but I want to spend my money on something more worthwhile than a picture of my ugly mug. Brandon laughed, insinuating my conceit. In my hypnotic state... I ignored that apparent insult and agreed. Okay, I'll catch up with you guys in a bit. The group was taken aback by my response, but acquiesced and left to ride the attractions while I approached the booth. I entered the tent-like structure and studied the artwork hanging around me until a man flamboyantly emerged from behind the curtain in the back. Hello, my dear, he greeted me. I am Ronaldo, the seer. I see the unseen and reveal what it is, not what is wished to be. It was clearly a circus act, but I was so captivated I didn't notice the cheesiness of the whole encounter. I really like your art, I said, flattering the artist. Would you draw me? I flashed an innocent smile. Are you sure? He asked intently, with a seriousness descending upon his demeanour. I will draw you as you truly are, and once it's done, the world will see you as I do. The process cannot be undone. He furrowed his brow with a smouldering intensity. I thought he was laying the act on a little thick, but that was the whole fun of the carnival, right? Oh, yes, I'm sure, I cheerfully replied, trying not to laugh at his portrayal. Have a seat. He stated, waving a hand to the metal folding chair in front of a cheap plastic table. I took my place and he sat in the seat across from me, pulling out his supplies from beneath the table. He studied me for a few minutes. His face was solemn and something else I couldn't quite put my finger on at the time, but I've only realized in hindsight. It was ominous, like he was judging me, but not my outward appearance. He was judging my soul, seeing right through me. Ronaldo's burning gaze began to make me feel uncomfortable. I smiled nervously and shifted in my seat. Scanning outside the tent for my friends, I found them laughing and running to get in line for another ride. 
I didn't think I'd ever seen them so happy and relaxed. Was that my doing? Did I make them tense around me? I wondered this during a brief moment as I watched my friends, when I almost had an epiphany about myself, but then Mandy playfully shoved Connor. Jumping to conclusions, my former selfish mindset resumed. In an instant, my curiosity turned to rage. Was Mandy flirting with him? Was one boyfriend not enough for her? That slut. How could she do this to me? She knows how much I like him. God, no one's loyal. Nobody loves me. These thoughts swirled around my head. I looked back to Ronaldo, who was now furiously scribbling on an easel he'd stealthily set up and positioned in a way so I couldn't see the drawing yet. This disappointed me because I desired to watch the process, but he was probably keeping up the mystique. After all, the mystery was the exciting part. It's the reason magicians never reveal their secrets. Once you know how a trick is done, it becomes mundane, trivial. Brandon suddenly burst into the tent, exclaiming, Boo! with Mandy and Connor close behind. Did I throw you off the groove of your picture? Brandon excitedly asked. No, dummy, he's a professional, I said in the snobbiest of tones. How's it coming? Mandy asked. Well, I'm sure it's going to be great, I presumptuously answered. Brandon started to make his way around the table to see, and the artist glared at him with penetrating eyes, until he backed away saying, Okay, I'm sorry, I'll wait, holding up his hands in surrender as if the artist had silently threatened him. Oh, if looks could kill, right? This made me smile, but that smile quickly retreated as Mandy took off her jacket and revealed a pink spaghetti strap tank top, which showed off her cleavage that I was so jealous of. Oof, I said, also remembering how she acted with Connor earlier. I've told you pink looks awful on you. Besides, God, it's so cliche nowadays. It's like, ooh, girl power. I emphasized those last two words with the classic valley girl accent. Mandy shamefully put her jacket back on, staring at the ground. Pausing his work, the artist said, You should be nicer to your friends. Otherwise, you won't have them when you need them. I was outraged by this judgment. Shut up and finish my picture already, or no tip. You can't buy the things in life that truly matter, he responded, laughing. And I am done, he added, pulling out a manila envelope and slid my picture inside. Remember what I told you, and enjoy the carnival. He dismissed me, waving towards the exit with a smug, almost sinister smile. As my friends and I left the tent, we passed Gabby, another girl from our school, with her excited little brother galloping in, dragging her by the arm. She was a large girl, not just overweight, but she was tall and awkward and one of my favourite people to pick on. Oh, can you draw me riding a dragon? The boy excitedly asked the artist. Of course, my dear boy, he warmly answered. During my entire encounter with the artist, he'd never show me that kind of warmth or kindness. Oh, I thought it was all part of the act. And, and my sister, can she be riding the dragon too? Of course, he answered, studying her. But I also want to make her her own special picture. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, 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 the boy answered, jumping up and down. He must have been about five or six years old. Oh, that incredibly excitable age. Well, you're going to need at least two pages for this one, anyways. I chimed in as I stormed out of the tent. The last things I heard as I walked away was Gabby loudly sigh, and the artist comforted her by saying, Don't worry, my dear. I can see how beautiful you are, and I can may. The voice trailed off until I was completely out of earshot. He could draw her however he wished, but it still wouldn't change reality. Following behind my friends through the carnival, I clutched the envelope to my chest, envisioning my portrait. Would it be angelic? The artist didn't seem to like me much, though. Maybe it would be a badass demonic representation of me. Oh, that would be even better. <gasps> the anticipation was overwhelming me. Hey guys, wait up, 
I yelled over the noise pollution of the carnival. I stopped to slide my picture from the envelope, unveiling a grotesque monstrosity drawn on the page. It was unlike anything I had expected, and scarcely resembled me. The thing's skin was primarily missing. What little remained existed in thin strips stretching over withered muscles. Sparse clumps of greasy hair protruded from the scalp, where the skull wasn't showing. The expression disturbed me the most. It looked like the thing was screaming, agonizingly so. Brandon, Mandy and Connor encircled me. Well, come on, let's see it, Brandon requested. Mandy seemingly could tell something was off, and jovially asked, What's wrong? Does the picture not do you justice? The guy was a hack. It doesn't even look like me, I dismissed, starting to slide the picture back into its envelope. Before I'd succeeded in hiding it, Brandon whipped it away from me, saying, oh, Come on now. Upon seeing the thing, he added, Whoa. This is pretty cool, honestly. Not what I expect from a caricature, but it's awesome. He passed it around to Connor and Mandy, who both agreed. It was actually cool. I didn't think so. Something about it made me uneasy. Maybe it was because the artist had said it was how he saw me. However, my friends didn't know that, and I thought it best to keep that information to myself. Brandon took one last look before handing the picture back to me, saying, That's pretty sweet. Thanks, I responded cheerfully, pretending to be pleased as well. I slid the paper back into its hiding place, and the four of us enjoyed the remainder of our night at the carnival. Unnerved by the picture, I never made a move on Connor, but I figured there would be other opportunities in the future. The next morning, I woke up and brushed my hair. I noticed my brush wasn't working very well, as it had filled up with strands I'd shed over the past week, which was odd, since I only need to empty it every other month, but, well, I shrugged it off. The rest of the weekend went by without anything terribly noteworthy happening. I laid in my yard, listening to music and tanning. I met up with Mandy at the mall and did the typical teenager thing. Monday morning came around, and I rolled out of bed to get ready for school. While brushing my long, dark hair, I noticed my brush was full again. Already? I wondered, suspiciously eyeing the brush. I ran my fingers through my mane and realized it felt thinner than usual. God, I'm going to have to switch back to the thickening conditioner again, I thought, sighing. I used a thickening agent for a while to gain more volume in my hair, but I'd switched to one with a more pleasant aroma. I assumed this change was the cause for the thinning out that I was now experiencing. Next on the agenda of the morning routine was applying makeup. Upon looking at myself in the mirror, I beheld little red blotches across my face. For a moment, I gasped in shock, completely horrified. What the... I began to panic. Well, I must have gotten too much sun over the weekend, I rationalized, examining the rest of my body. The blotches were on my arms, chest and stomach too. I felt completely appalled. Grasping at straws for any explanation, I reasoned that, well, my sunscreen must be expired. I just got too much sun in certain spots because of it. This excuse satisfied me and I calmed down as I used a thick layer of cover-up over my face and chest. I put on a thin, long sleeve shirt to hide the rest and headed for school. Strolling down the halls with my head held high, I adorned my usual air of superiority. I was still thrown off by my own securities from the morning I'd had so far, and no insults came to mind. As I passed by, my fellow students seemed to be whispering and casting odd glares my way. I pulled stringy strands of hair over my chest uncomfortably. Was it my skin? Could they see the blotchiness? I thought I'd covered it well enough, but apparently not. This behavior continued all the way to my locker. I quickly opened it and hid behind the door, trying to compose myself. Oh, I should have just stayed at home, I thought, deeply regretting showing my face in public. Hey, you! 
came Mandy's voice. I pulled away from the locker and flashed a smile. Hey! How are you doing? Mandy asked. Her voice was tinged with worry. Uh, I'm great, I quickly spun out. Yeah? Um, did you... I interrupted her question. Look, I just got a little too much sun and my sunscreen had expired. No biggie, I'll be fine in a couple of days. Mandy's face twisted with a confused expression. Okay, but did you hear? I mean, everybody's been talking. I cut her off again. I don't care what anyone says. It's fine. Okay, she said, drawing out the word apprehensively. We should get to class. I ended the conversation, slammed my locker and left her puzzled in the hallway. I couldn't believe everyone was gossiping about me. I sat through my classes in a despondent state until lunch. My friends and I sat around our table and I picked at my unappetizing meal. I was unable to focus on the chatter of my friends. Every inch of my skin itched incessantly. Sunburns usually itch like hell. I reminded myself not to scratch and scar myself. and I ran my fingers through my hair, forcing it away from my face. I looked down at the handful of strands and quietly flicked them onto the floor before anyone could notice. Oh my God, B, your face, Mandy said, shocked. It's fine, I told you. I just got too much sun, I dismissed. No, you're bleeding, she harrowingly said. Yeah, oh, that looks bad, Connor added. What? I asked, confused, feeling a warm drip slide down my cheek. Oh, shit, I must have scratched my sunburn reflexively, I assumed as I stood and ran to the bathroom with my hand covering the side of my face. Looking into the dingy mirror, I discovered a sizable gash through my right cheek. Blood streamed down my face in crimson droplets. Panicking, I grabbed a paper towel from the dispenser and held it tight to stop the bleeding. This cannot be happening. I reached to replace the paper towel and my sleeve slid up, revealing my raw forearm. God, what the actual... The bathroom door swung open and Gabby shyly walked in. She shot me an uncomfortably nervous smile and passed by to enter a stall. Her clothes seemed baggier than usual, practically falling off her. Either she was wearing larger clothes or she'd lost weight. I would have paid more mind to this if I hadn't been so absorbed in my own problems at the moment. She finished up in the stall and came to use the sink beside me. Seeing her face in the mirror, I noticed her skin looked clearer. Her acne was receding. She looked up and made eye contact, and I quickly turned my face away. Are you okay? She asked with genuine concern. This caught me off guard. I'd never once shown her any kindness. Why would she care about me? Yeah, I just scratched myself harder than I thought. Time for a manicure. We both laughed and I added, You're looking good. You doing something different? Not really. She shrugged, smiling. I've lost quite a few pounds and my skin started clearing up over the weekend. I guess I grew out of it like my mum said I would. I nodded, unsure how to respond. Well, have fun with the manicure, she said, before leaving me alone in the bathroom. Cautiously, I removed the bloody paper towel. The gash seemed to have grown, revealing the muscle behind the skin. I ran my fingers through my hair again, and as I expected, I held a clump of it. Fuming, my thoughts spiraled. What kind of backwards world was this where I was falling apart and Gabby was looking better by the minute? And then, I remembered the artist at the carnival. Had he somehow cursed me? <laughs> no, that's crazy. That doesn't really happen, does it? The saying goes that all legends are based on truth. Maybe he cursed me and blessed Gabby. What was it he said? He sees the unseen and reveals what you really are. Is this what he saw in me? A monstrosity? In my picture, the thing had barely any hair or skin. Was I going to become that? The thought made me shudder. 
I looked down at my forearm and saw the skin was splitting apart. Panic gripped me. There has to be a way to stop this. If I can just talk to Ronaldo, maybe I can convince him that I've learned my lesson and he can reverse this. I resolved to find him immediately. There literally wasn't a second to waste. I left school without saying a word to anyone and headed back to the carnival. Surely there would be hell to pay when I returned for ditching school like that, but I couldn't care less about that at the moment. There was no way I could explain why I had to leave anyways. I was cursed and have to go back to the carnival to get it undone. Well, that wouldn't work. I might even be locked up for a psychological break. I'd have to deal with the consequences later. As I approached the side of the carnival, I could see it was currently packing up to move on to another town. Surrounded by collapsed rides and tents, everything looked different. I didn't see Ronaldo's booth anywhere. A worker passed me by with his arms full of ropes and rigging equipment. I stopped him, asking, Excuse me, sir, where can I find Ronaldo? The man smirked and turned to walk away. I grabbed his arm and begged, Please, please, it's tell me. He pointed in the direction of a semi-truck and silently walked away. I ran towards the truck, calling out desperately, Ronaldo, Ronaldo. He emerged from behind the truck, smiling. Hello, my dear. How are you? He asked as if we were old friends. Collapsing at his feet, I struggled to catch my breath as I pitifully asked, D Did you do this to me? His wicked smile expanded. No, no, my dear, he began mockingly. You did it to yourself. I warned you that you would become as you truly are. He paused for dramatic effect and continued. From the first moment I saw you, I knew what you were. Now the world can see it too. That sinister smile was plastered across his face. But... <laughs> I tried to argue with tears welling up in my forlorn eyes. No. He sternly reprimanded it, as if I were a disobedient dog. How many people have you treated badly? Behaved like a monster to? You have corrupted your soul. Now your appearance is appropriate. Isn't there any way I can fix this? Please, sir, I'll do anything. Hmm. He pondered for a moment, stroking his beard before answering me. If you can be genuinely kind to others... Do enough good to atone for all the harm you have inflicted. Then perhaps I could draw a new portrait. With how adulterated your soul is, though. His voice trailed off and he shrugged to convey his disbelief and disinterest. I can do it. I'll do anything. I've learned my lesson, I promise. I sincerely reassured. Though I could tell from his expression that he wasn't convinced. How do I find you again when I'm ready? He pulled a business card from his sleeve and flicked it to me. Good luck, my dear, and good bar. And at that, he took his leave and vanished behind the semi. I strolled away from the sight of the carnival shambles, brainstorming good deeds I could do. I could volunteer at a retirement home, or the soup kitchen, or... My thought was interrupted by my cell phone ringing. I pulled it from my pocket and saw the caller ID. It was Mandy, probably wondering why I'd disappeared from school. Hey, I answered. Are you okay? Hey. Mandy's voice was full of concern. Yeah. I... Look, it seems like you're taking Shannon's death really hard, but there's no way you could have known. Wait. What? Shannon's dead? I was completely taken aback by this news. Yeah, it's all anyone's been talking about all day. How? Mandy was silent. Mandy? She... I could tell Mandy was searching for the right words to say. Choking back tears, she finally explained. It happened last Friday, after she left school. By the time her parents got home, it... It was too late. She paused to clear her throat. I was in total shock. Mandy continued. 
Everyone says it was because of the bullying. But there's no way you could have known that she would do something like that. High school's rough. Just, just don't blame yourself. I didn't deserve her sympathetic tone. My arm fell limply to my side, and the phone slipped through my fingers to the ground. I froze, catatonic. I killed her. Maybe not deliberately, but it was my fault entirely. There was no amount of volunteering and good deeds in the world I could possibly do to make up for that. Even if I solved world hunger, I could never bring her back from the grave. I hadn't even known I'd done such a terrible thing, but Ronaldo knew. He could see it, and he punished me for it, deservedly. I shut myself up in my room for as long as I could, slowly, painfully dwindling away. When my dad finally broke down my bedroom door, he was horrified by what he saw, and rightly so. I still remember his shocked gasp as he covered his mouth and said, My God, Brianna, you need help. Most of my hair was gone, along with a good portion of my skin, and I could feel my muscles atrophying, withering away. First, there were the doctors thinking I had an aggressive form of leprosy. Next, there were the specialists, dermatologists, taking samples fruitlessly. Then, finally, I ended up here, in a special research facility. Patient zero of a new plague that seems to have only infected me. I know what's wrong with me, even if no one believes me. And I know I'll die here. The only good I can do is be friendly to the nurses, doctors and scientists. And to write this. Maybe I can save you from the same grisly fate. I won't tell you to avoid Ronaldo the Seer. In fact, I changed his name and certain elements about him in this story. Nor should you avoid caricatures, for that is not his true profession. Perhaps he doesn't even work for carnivals. My advice is simply to be kind. Be good to your fellow humans, and be good to your soul. Nurture it. Shape it into something you're not afraid to see. Don't be a monstrosity like me. Well, I really, really love stories like this. You know why? Because the protagonist sets up such emotions in all of you. Do you feel sorry for her? I bet most of you don't, but you're a little bit too afraid to say it, aren't you? <laughs> or maybe not. Well, thoughts, feelings in the comments section below the video. And as ever, I'll do my best to reply to as many as I can. Now, the last couple of Wednesdays I've done anthology videos leading up to Halloween. Tonight, I... Well, I've postponed it and it's coming on Friday. So, big, big video coming on Friday for you all. You're going to join me for it, aren't you? Of course you are. Until then, sweet dreams, my dear friends. And bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>